Friday Sunday afternoon tour. Of course, uh, since the beginning of this season, we've been doing the tours on Zoom, and we'll be continuing to do that for a while until we get the go ahead to meet in person again, either at Ross Bay Cemetery, where we often are, or in some of the other cemeteries, such as today and also next week. Uh, today, we're going to be at Pioneer Square virtually. Uh, because uh, I'm doing this one from the comfort of my living room. My name is John Adams. I will be your guide today. And our host is Liz, Liz Taylor. And uh, she has, is the one who's been admitting you as you have entered the waiting room. And she will be the one uh, controlling mute and unmute and whatever else is needed to, to keep the, uh, the program going this afternoon. If there are any technical difficulties, hopefully Liz, who has been very, very adept at fixing any problems in the past couple of weeks, will be able to sort them out. And I must thank in advance Liz and her husband, Paul, Paul Taylor, um, who have helped me out over the past couple of days as I've been experimenting doing a different format, at least for me. I'm sure it's not new to all of you. Today's topic is a very special one because it just happened that today, um, April the 25th, coincides with a very special important uh, event uh, from Victoria's past. April the 25th, 1858, is often cited as the very beginning of the gold rush. And the gold rush um, is a very important aspect in Victoria's history. So I'm just going to uh, get away from that and uh, talk to you in, in, as in person as we can be. For historians, April the 25th, 1858 really does mark uh, an epic, uh, the beginning of an epic in Victoria's history. Of course, Indigenous people, the Songhees, the Esquimalt, and many others in this area had been living here for thousands of years, for countless generations. And then in 1843, the Hudson's Bay Company arrived and they built the trading post called Fort Victoria on the eastern shore of Victoria Harbor. And for quite a long time, it was the employees and their families of the, of the Hudson's Bay Company and the Songhees and the other indigenous people living across the harbor. That was the, the way right through the 1850s until that day in 1858, when everything suddenly began to change. And so what I'd like to do is to focus on that day, uh, Sunday, April the 25th, 1858, and we might stray a little bit either side as well as we go, uh, but I'd like to start right in by um, showing you some of the pictures. We'll resume with the picture that we had right here, uh, showing the fort and the steamship beaver in the harbor in front of it. So we have here a painting from 1846 by Paul Kane, and it was just by chance that he came uh, to the fort in 1846, uh, the year that the Oregon Boundary Treaty uh, was settled and Fort Victoria was going to become the headquarters for the Hudson's Bay Company west of the Rocky Mountains. Previous to that, it was in Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River. You can see in his painting, the fort, very good description, a depiction of the fort on the right-hand side, and the Songhees village on the west side or the left-hand side in the painting. Inside the fort, it was a very typical Hudson's Bay Company fur trading post, uh, big log walls called palisades all around, two gates in Victoria, one facing the harbor and one facing the, uh, the hinterland, what is now Fort Street, and then very large squared log structures forming a quadrangle around the, the walls of the fort. And the biggest of the buildings was called the Big House. It was the mess hall, as you can see here. This is from Fort Vancouver. We don't have any interior pictures of Fort Victoria at all, although there are a few exterior pictures. But the, the buildings in the forts all tended to be the same. And the Big House, which would be the residence of the chief factor and of his family, um, it would also contain the mess hall where the officers of the company would dine in style. As you can see here, the table is set. So just remember this picture because a little bit later on, we have a view of or a description of something that happened in the big house uh, back in the fall of 1857. So just to set the context, uh, we have here a map that was drawn 
in the 1850s by Joseph Despard Pemberton. We'll talk about him a little bit later on as well. And he was the surveyor general for the Hudson's Bay Company at that time. You can see here uh, where the circle is, Fort Victoria. And we have a small picture of uh, the fort as it was painted uh, shortly after the gold rush by Sarah Kreese, one of the people who came here. She came with her husband who was a lawyer, but she was an artist and she uh, painted a number of pictures that she sent back to her folks back in England and were very fortunate that they kept them and later donated them to the BC archives. Here is a large version of that painting taken from the big house, looking down through the middle of the fort to the main gate that looks out over the harbor. So there's the fort on the left-hand side underneath the big circle, but have a look at the smaller circle uh, closer to the right-hand side. That is the location of what we now call Pioneer Square. That's the official city name, it's a city park, but which I prefer, and I think many members of the Old Cemeteries Society prefer to call the Old Burying Ground. It went by various names, the Quadra Street Cemetery, the Burying Ground, and various other things, but uh, today we know it. We know it as Pioneer Square. It's some distance from the fort, as you can see. And it was directly across the street from the very first church structure that was constructed in what is now British Columbia. Of course, it wasn't British Columbia back in 1858 yet. We had one colony, the colony of Vancouver Island, but the rest of what later became British Columbia was unorganized territory ostensibly under the British crown, but um, it was not organized and certainly the name British Columbia had not yet been adopted. So we have here a picture of the Victoria District Church, it was as it was called. Construction began in 1854 or thereabouts, but it didn't get completed until 1856. But uh, it was in fact um, from that church that the very first view of something that began to change the history of Fort Victoria took place. And it was a Sunday morning and the Reverend Cridge was coming out of the church with his congregation. And we might imagine that Perhaps the strains of the barrel organ were just fading away when the congregation arrived at the door of the church. And this is a painting from that era that shows the view from what was called Church Hill, looking out over the harbor. And the trees had been cut down for fuel or for the pickets of the, the fort. And you can see a few men looking out over the rather empty harbor. And they perhaps chatted. These were members of the Anglican uh, faith. Uh, there were lots of Catholics here. In fact, the majority of the, of the people connected with the Hudson's Bay Company were Catholic, mostly French Canadian and their Métis and indigenous wives. But in fact, uh, there were a number of Anglicans and they had come perhaps from the surrounding farms. We'll see pictures of some of them a little bit later on. And then they looked out and something strange began to happen. They saw a steamer, a side wheeler actually, coming into the harbor and then it disappeared around the corner. Well, they didn't know what was going on at first and so they went down to investigate and they discovered that that ship had brought about 300 gold miners, the very first contingent from San Francisco who came up uh, to start the gold rush. Of course, nobody knew it was going to happen at that time. And our stories today really relate to a lot of the people that were there at the church or who were in Victoria at that time. Of course, the Reverend Edward Cridge should probably be one of the first that we talk about. And what I'd like to do is to uh, take you to Pioneer Square and to uh, tell you a little bit more about him. And I can do this through the magic of Zoom because a few days ago, anticipating rain today, 
turned out to be a lovely day in, in the end, but in anticipation of a rainy day, uh, my son Chris accompanied me to Pioneer Square and he videoed a number of segments that we'll show. The first one is coming up. The Reverend Edward Critch had a large family. He and his wife came here in 1855. He was the sole Anglican clergyman in all of what is now British Columbia. The Reverend Critch and his wife had many children in their long lives. In fact, the Reverend Critch and Mrs. Critch are buried at Ross Bay Cemetery, and some of their other family members are buried there as well. But this marker, which used to be upright, but for many, many years has been laid flat on the ground, is for four of their infant children, and also for the sister of the Reverend Cridge. Her name was Mary. The names here are a poignant reminder that back in the Victorian era, families were used to infant death, and the Cridges lost within a matter of months four of their young children. Frederick, Edward, Eber, and Grace all died on different days in 1865. They died during an epidemic of diphtheria that raged through Victoria and carried away not only four of the Cridge children, but many other children and adults as well. The Reverend Cridge, at the time his children died, was Dean of Christchurch Cathedral. But originally he had been the Reverend Cridge of the original Anglican Church known as the Victoria District Church. Only later did it become Christchurch Cathedral. So as we stand at the Cridge grave, and some of you probably have done so many times, uh, but just for those that haven't been to Pioneer Square, let me explain that um, Pioneer Square itself is a very small cemetery. It's basically half a city block. And the uh, space where the Cridge uh, family grave is, um, is in one corner, the southwestern corner. And from there, it's just a matter of paces to the place called Naval Corner. And Naval Corner um, is a place where a number of naval officers and others are buried. Um, here's a painting showing the, the naval uh, dockyard at Esquimalt. And uh, the, the ship that is shown here is HMS Sutledge, Her Majesty's Ship Sutledge. And um, our next clip is about a monument specifically devoted to the people from the Sutledge. We're in Naval Corner at Pioneer Square, and this large obelisk devoted to the officers and crew of HMS Sutledge that was in these waters in the early 1860s is the most prominent aspect of this area today. But at one time, back in 1858 and later, there were many headstones right around here. The Amethyst, the Havana, the Calypso, the Ganges, the Satellite, and Plumper. All ships of Her Majesty's Navy at various times stationed here in Victoria uh, were commemorated on the monuments in this corner. And until recently, at least one of the other monuments to HMS Sutledge was in existence here in Pioneer Square, but it was in very bad condition and has since been moved to storage. Certainly in 1858, many of the officers probably would have come on a Sunday if they were Anglicans to the Victoria District Church. They would have also had services on board their own ships. And when they died, the officers had a choice of being buried out in Esquimalt, either on Dead Man's Island at the entrance to Esquimalt Harbor, or later at the Naval Cemetery, now God's Acre, the Naval and uh, Veteran Cemetery, or they could be buried here. And many of the ones who are buried here were officers. On a monument like this, 
erected after HMS Sutledge departed these waters in 1865, the names of those who had died while they were on this station, either of disease or accidents, were inscribed here. Many of them had been buried at sea. Some of them, indeed, had been buried in Esquimalt, but some had been buried here at Pioneer Square. Long ago, the names on this soft sandstone obelisk have crumbled away. The inscription is partly duplicated here in marble down at the base. The names, fortunately, were recorded many, many years ago before the last ones did it. Okay, I'm just going to stop there for a moment and uh, mention that from Naval Corner, if we were to walk a short distance um, into Pioneer Square along what is now Rockland Avenue, uh, we would come to a series of graves that are connected by family uh, links and uh, they are linked to the family of James and Amelia Douglas. Uh, later, Sir James Douglas upon his retirement and Lady Douglas, of course, that was after 1864. And so um, I'd like to now uh, go a little bit farther into Pioneer Square and we'll catch up with those graves. Here is Sir James Douglas himself and Lady Douglas. And they had 13 children during their lifetime. Unfortunately, seven of the children died when they were babies, um, but a number of them did survive. The oldest to survive was Cecilia. The next was Jane. Uh, the next was Agnes. And I'm gonna leave a gap for a moment. We had James Jr., the only surviving son of the, the family and the baby of the family, Martha. And now we'll fill in the gap in the sequence. Uh, Agnes, Alice. Uh, Alice was a bit of a black sheep in the family. She was the one that eloped with her father's private secretary in 1861. But this is the Douglas family. They had one baby buried at Pioneer Square back in the early 1850s. Rebecca was her name and she was carried on her mother's knee when the family arrived here from Fort Vancouver when they first moved to Victoria in 1849. But Rebecca died and was buried in the old Fort graveyard, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, but was later moved to Pioneer Square. So uh, we'll be talking now about some of the family members, Alexander and Jane Dallas. Um, Jane was the second oldest daughter and she married Alexander Grant Dallas. Uh, they were both here in 1858. Uh, Alexander Grant Dallas was planning not to stay around. Um, he was a director of the Hudson's Bay Company and had come here only to check up on James Douglas, just to make sure that the books and the management were being well looked after. He was planning to head back to England, but luck would have it, he fell in love with Jane and they did get married in the early winter of 1858 not planning to stay around, but then the gold rush happened and they did stay around and well, as sometimes happens, Jane got pregnant. So they weren't able to leave Victoria and they stayed around until the baby was born. She was christened Helena by the uh, Reverend Cridge at the Victoria District Church, but unfortunately Helena at the age of 11 months died and was buried at Pioneer Square. But, Jane's oldest sister is buried at Pioneer Square. You see her here, Cecilia was her name. And in 1852, she married Dr. John Sebastian Helmkin. And I'd like to show you a clip now about uh, them, uh, but also about David Cameron, who was the brother-in-law of Sir James Douglas and the uncle of Cecilia, Cecilia Helmkin. So without further ado, let's have a look at those graves and find out a little bit more about them. This is the tomb for 
two members of the Hamkin family who were adults, Cecilia, who was the oldest surviving daughter of James and Amelia Douglas, and her husband, Dr. John Sebastian Hamkin. Cecilia was born at Fort Vancouver, but moved up here when her family came here. She was just a teenager at the time. That was in 1849. The following year, when dashing young Dr. Helmkin arrived fresh from a five and a half month voyage around Cape Horn, they fell in love. In fact, it was love at first sight. And they were married at Christmas time, two years later in 1852. The little house that they built for themselves, we now call it Helmkin House, stands on its original site, right next to where the Royal BC Museum is today. And there, seven children were born to the Helmkins. Unfortunately, three of them died in infancy, and two of them were buried in the side garden where they could look out from their bedroom window and see the graves. And the doctor had planted an oval of white daisies around the graves so they could see them better. But in 1865, Cecilia died herself. She died of pneumonia shortly after having given birth to the seventh child. And she was buried here in this vault and some of her dying words were that her children, who had been buried in the garden, be exhumed and be placed here on her tomb. They were. And when the youngest died, shortly afterwards, he too was buried here with his mother and his two siblings. Eventually, this little cemetery closed. That was in 1873. Dr. Helmkin had never remarried. And he lived on until his own death at the age of 96 in 1920. He was buried, or he should have been buried, at Ross Bay Cemetery, because this cemetery had closed all those years before in 1873. But because Dr. Helmkin was such a prominent individual, and because his wife was already here, as long as he was cremated, and in 1920 that was not a normal thing, it is today, but it wasn't then, his body was sent down to Seattle and cremated there, and then he was allowed to be buried with his wife. His ashes were placed in her tomb, and along with the other three infant children. They witnessed the arrival of the steamship Commodore on April the 25th, 1858. But so too did the people who were buried in this tomb just over here. This is where the sister of Sir James Douglas lies buried. Her name was Cecilia, and her niece, Cecilia Helmkin, was named after her. This Cecilia was born in the country now called Guyana. When she was born there in 1812, it was British Guyana. She married twice, her second husband, was a man by the name of David Cameron from Scotland, from Perth. He was a cloth merchant in Perth, but went to the colonies and ended up working for the Douglas family on their plantations and became manager of one of them, a plantation called Belmont. He and Cecilia were married and they had one daughter, but unfortunately, Cecilia was not doing well with a very hot and humid climate although she had lived there her whole life, she became ill. Her brother here in Victoria, Sir James Douglas, had provided money to her uh, through the years. He had never seen her since she was a baby. And he arranged in the early 1850s for his brother-in-law, David Cameron, to get a job in the coal mines at Nanaimo, not as a miner, but as, as a manager above ground. And so they arrived. Fort Victoria had been built. They arrived in the early 1850s, and you can imagine brother Sir James and Cecilia being reunited after almost 40 years, never having seen each other and only having corresponded by letter. Their house, which they named Belmont after the estate in Guyana, stood where Fort Rod Hill is now and Belmont Park. They were Anglicans, and probably on a Sunday, when they were able to, they would have traveled 
by water from Esquimalt around to Victoria to attend the services at the Victoria District Church. And although we don't know for sure, we believe that they were among the congregation who filed out of the church on that Sunday morning, April the 25th, 1858, to see the steamship Commodore come into the harbor and thus begin the gold rush. So we have bench tombs, the style of tomb that we just looked at, the Helmkins and the Camerons buried close together uh, under what appear to be boxes made of sandstone above the ground. And if you go to some cemeteries like the cemeteries in New Orleans, they would tell you that they were del deliberately built like that so that the bodies could be placed above the waterline, above the ground. But here they didn't do that. They buried the bodies in the ground and the bench tombs were simply a, a type of uh, tombstone above the ground. And not too far away from the Helmkins and the, the Camerons, there is another bench tomb. It's for John Work. Uh, his wife, Josette, or Suzette, as she's sometimes called, um, is not there, but John Work is buried at uh, the old burying ground. And um, I'd like to, uh, to show you a, a clip uh, that I, I filmed there uh, when we filmed the other ones just to let you know a little bit more about him. Another bench tomb. This time it's for another Hudson's Bay Company chief factor. His name is John Work. John Work and his wife, Suzette, Suzette Legasse, a Métis woman uh, from what is now Washington State, had a very large family of daughters and a couple of sons. Most of them are buried at Ross Bay Cemetery. However, John Work died in 1860. He died just before Christmas, 1860. And his farm called Hillside was not very far away. And it's almost certain that he and his family would have come down to attend the Victoria District Church on Sundays. And so, in all likelihood, he was there in the, in the group that filed out of the church and watched the steamship Commodore come into the harbor. But even if he wasn't, and we have no way of knowing whether he was actually there or not, he would have been well aware of the gold rush. And he's probably one of the ones that sat around the table in the mess hall at Fort Victoria at the end of 1857, when James Douglas held up a bottle half filled with coarse gold that had come down from the Hudson's Bay Company trading post at Fort Kamloops. And they had acquired it from the indigenous people along the Thompson and Fraser rivers who had picked it up. It had been wedged in rocks and they picked it up and the chief trader at Fort Kamloops said, well, bring us more. We'd be glad to have as much as you can bring. And so, John Work and most of the other officers of the Hudson's Bay Company were there that evening when James Douglas showed them the gold that had been brought down. Of course, gold is a very popular thing when the word gets out and they could not keep it quiet. They could have imagined perhaps that people might come to search for gold. They had no way of knowing that 30,000 people would arrive from April 1858 right through the summer of that year inundating Victoria and changing life here forever, but also changing life for almost all parts of British Columbia as well. So John Work, one of those people, definitely who was here in 1858, but sadly he didn't live much longer past the big gold rush era. So we'll just pause there for a moment and uh, because Pioneer Square is not a very big place, uh, if we were there in person, it would only take us a, a 30 seconds to walk uh, to the place that I'm going to show you next. But I should mention that as we do this, uh, we would have passed what was a, a line that was very well delineated in the early days. It was a fence, in fact, and it separated the Protestant section of the cemetery, primarily Anglican, from the Roman Catholic section. And uh, the, the fence was built at the behest of the Catholic bishop, Modeste de Mers, to separate his section 
uh, which is in the eastern part of Pioneer Square from that in the western section. And as we uh, walk to the next couple of graves, we're going to be entering uh, the Catholic section. But before we do that, I'd just like to uh, show you another clip about one of the other people that was connected with the Hudson's Bay Company. And this will segue into the, the next person that we'll be talking about. The person I'd like to introduce next is Roderick Finlayson, a contemporary of James Douglas and of John Work. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about him next. Another bench tomb. No, there we go. Here's Roderick Finlayson. And I should mention that he uh, was responsible for um, opening up the very first graveyard. Uh, Pioneer Square was not the first graveyard for the Hudson's Bay Company um, at Fort Victoria. There had been an earlier one. And this is an illustration of it. It's a watercolor. It was not intended to show the little cemetery. You can see the, the fence around the plots. But if you look in the distance, it's a little bit blurry, but uh, there are some soldiers and the artist was actually uh, intending to show the soldiers and par portion of Fort Victoria off to the right. But uh, in 1844, it was Roderick Fenlison who was responsible for um, uh, supervising the first burial in the new little Fort Victoria graveyard. Um, it was the grave of Charles Ross. And the next clip will explain a little bit more about who Fenlison and Ross were. John and Suzette Work had eight daughters. One of them was Jane. And she married Roderick Finlayson, who from 1843 on was either the second in charge or the person in charge of Fort Victoria. He was here when the fort was being constructed in 1843. When it was finished, he was working under Charles Ross. Ross was the man who had actually overseen the construction of the fort. But unfortunately, Charles Ross died of acute appendicitis in June of 1844. And Roderick Finlayson was put in charge. And he remained in charge of the fort until 1849, when James Douglas was posted to the fort. And Roderick continued on as the accountant, and he served many other roles with the Hudson's Bay Company over the years. So I'd like to go back and talk about Charles Ross. Charles Ross, whose marker is right here, was a career man in the fur trade. He was from Scotland. And over the years, he had been right across the country and had married a woman by the name of Isabella. Isabella was Ashanabi. Her father was Ojibwe. And she, in fact, came with Charles Ross when he arrived here in 1843 to supervise the construction of Fort Victoria. But unfortunately, he did die the following year, quite unexpectedly, and was buried in the old Fort Victoria graveyard. That graveyard was deemed unsuitable as a burying spot because it was slumping down into the stream and it said that pigs were rooting up some of the corpses. And so in 1855, Pioneer Square was developed. It wasn't called Pioneer Square at the time, but the bodies of Charles Ross and most of the others were left in the old Fort Victoria graveyard until sometime around 1858. And then they were exhumed and the chain gang brought them here. And they were buried, some of them in large open pits, some of them like Charles Ross in individual graves. His grandson was the one who was able to identify where the grave site was because eventually most of the graves were cleared away. Pathways were put in and grass was planted where there really hadn't been any pathways or grass before. But the grandson of Charles Ross remembered coming here so many times when he was a boy to pay respects at his grandfather's grave he knew precisely where it was. And so in 1943, on the 
100th anniversary of the construction of Fort Victoria, this grave was marked by the uh, Historical Society. And indeed, it's still here for us to see today, right beside the pathway. Ross Bay, where Ross Bay Cemetery is located today, was not named after Charles Ross. It was named after his widow, Isabella. After Charles's death, she moved down to Fort Nisqually, or the area near Fort Nisqually, close to where Tacoma is today. But later, she came back to Vancouver Island. And the Hudson's Bay Company was selling land. They had made agreements with the local indigenous people, and the land was for sale. She bought 99 acres, and she paid for it, the going rate of one pound an acre. And by doing so, she became the first woman in what is now British Columbia to own land in her own name. From her farmhouse, overlooking the shore of Ross Bay, right in the middle of where the cemetery is today, she would have had a clear view out over the ocean, out over the Straits of Juan de Fuca and the Olympic Mountains, and from there, she could see race rocks. And she would have noticed, perhaps, if she'd looked up, a very unusual sight. There was a plume of smoke. Now, there were some steamers in those days, but there were still lots of sailboats as well. She might have looked and wondered what was coming in as it rounded race rocks and headed into Victoria Harbor. But certainly, she would have found out very soon that it was a very special ship because that was the arrival of the first contingent of gold miners. She would not have been at the Victoria District Church on the Sunday morning, April the 25th, because she was an Anglican. Whether she attended the services in a small salmon storage house that was devoted to the Catholics, we don't know. But certainly from her homestead at Ross Bay, she would have had a clear view of the steamship Commodore coming into the harbor. We have only one known photograph of Isabella Ross. And uh, this is a portion of that photograph. And she really was a remarkable woman in many ways. And when I was trying to find a way to include her and her husband uh, for that matter in the, the stories today, um, I realized that from Ross Bay, from where Isabella lived, there is a clear view out over the area of Race Rocks, and she quite likely, if she had looked up, would have seen that steamboat coming in. Now, let me uh, show you perhaps the steamboat that we saw coming in before. She would have seen it arriving, and then perhaps she would have wondered what it was and maybe wouldn't have given it too much more thought until uh, she began to hear very quickly that all those miners were in town. Um, it changed her life forever because uh, among the people who came in 1858 was Robert Burnaby. And not too long afterwards, um, he bought a portion of land from Isabella Ross. Perhaps she was hard up for cash and he bought a portion of her land. And she continued to occupy the rest of it um, but the portion that Burnaby bought was later sold to the city of Victoria Cemetery Trustees, and that became the first part of Ross Bay Cemetery. Now, from the grave of Charles Ross, uh, to, to find Isabella's grave, we would have to go to Ross Bay Cemetery, but from the grave of Charles Ross, we walk across a small area over to the eastern side of Pioneer Square. And I should mention that in the earlier clip, when I said that the cemetery um, Pioneer Square had been cleared, I wasn't referring to the, the, to the actual burials. I was referring only to the tombstones and the curbings around them. Because although we'll never know exactly how many people were buried at Pioneer Square, we know that at least 1300 people are still there. The vast majority of those who had been buried there from 1855 right up until 1873. A few, but only a few, were actually exhumed by the families and taken to the new cemetery at Ross Bay. And so what was taken away? The tombstones on top. But in 1908, when the cemetery was cleared to 
create the park. It was becoming a mess and difficult to maintain and hopefully they wouldn't do it today, but they did it back then. Uh, they pushed a number of the tombstones up against the Eastern fence. And since then many were vandalized and have been removed, some of them to save storage. And it's to that area that we're going to be going right now for our next clip to talk about um, a very special part of the, the contingent who came on the Commodore. And um, it's the uh, small contingent of blacks who arrived and they were the, uh, the vanguard of many more who came in 1858 and 1859. Many Blacks had gone to the gold rush in California. Uh, California ostensibly was a free state. However, more and more, the Blacks there were, were facing discrimination. Uh, so the children, for example, the Black children were not allowed to go to school. And so many of them decided that they would find a different home. And there was a meeting in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church uh, that was attended by Captain Jeremiah Nagel who um, had carried a note from James Douglas here in Victoria to them. And he happened to arrive um, at a very important meeting night uh, that was conducted by the Reverend John Jameson Moore. Um, he was the pastor of that church. And uh, they were there uh, partly to pray and partly to sing, but also to discuss where they might go. And they were having a very special uh, meeting that night because uh, one of their number um, had been um, the subject of a, of a very important uh, court case. His name was Archie Lee. And Archie Lee uh, was considered a fugitive slave by some, but the courts had actually released him, but it was a bit touchy. And so the black community decided enough was enough. Um, they would move and it turns out that Archie Lee went with them. And here is a small poster that uh, talked about the, the case, Archie, to the Friends of the Constitution and Laws, a committee appointed by the colored people having expended a large amount and incurred heavy obligations in prosecuting and defending the case in the courts of Sacramento, Stockton and San Francisco, and believing the principles to be vindicated are those which should interest all lovers of right and justice independent of complexion, respectfully solicit contributions for this object, which will be faithfully appropriated if left with E.J. Johnson. Now, as Jeremiah Nagel, Captain Nagel, entered the church to make his presentation, inviting them to come here, he probably heard this music. Maybe not. It's an old Methodist hymn, Go Ye the Trumpets Blow. And it was in fact, a version of that tune that was being sung when Nagel was present at the meeting. And it's important to remember that that tune would have been sung here when they arrived. Let's go to the section of Pioneer Square where a couple of the uh, black pioneers are buried. Uh, one of them that we'll see first is the grave of Hannah Estes. This is the grave of Hannah Estes. She wasn't here on April the 25th, 1858, but she came shortly afterwards that year, along with her husband. Howard Estes and Hannah had been born in slavery 
in Missouri. But Howard had been allowed to go to California on a cattle drive. He had earned money and had sent it back and had bought the freedom, not only of Hannah, but of one of their children as well. They eventually moved to California themselves. The daughter, who had been purchased, Sylvia, eventually married a man by the name of Louis Stark. And the Starks and the Estes decided to come here as a family in 1858. They eventually moved to Salt Spring Island and other places as well. And they're well known there as one of the pioneer families. Unfortunately, Hannah died in the 1860s and she remained here. We don't know exactly where her grave was. This is one of the gravestones that was moved over to this corner in 1908. But originally, this monument and all of the others behind me had been somewhere out there. We really don't know where. But Hannah Estes is one of several black people buried here at the old burying ground, one of two that has a marker. The other one is just over here, and he has a very remarkable story as well. His name is Abner Hunt Francis. I'll go over there now. The obelisk made of granite uh, inscribed with the name of Abner Hunt Francis is very difficult to read. It's lightly carved, and because of the, the lichen and the dirt, it's almost impossible to read, especially in this light. Abner Hunt Francis, who was he? Well, he was born in the eastern United States, and he moved to Buffalo, and that's where he married a woman by the name of Cynthia Dandridge. The Dandridges, a black family, eventually moved to Victoria shortly after 1858, and Abner Hunt Francis and Cynthia moved to Portland. But they weren't welcome there. In fact, no blacks were welcome in Portland. And so eventually, the call from the Dandridges here brought them to Victoria. Abner Hunt Francis was elected to Victoria City Council in the fall of 1865. He was the first black person in what is now British Columbia to be elected to city council. He didn't serve his term, in fact, because they discovered the fact that he did not have the proper property qualifications which were needed at that time. But nonetheless, Abner Hunt Francis and Hannah Estes were buried here at Pioneer Square, even though they weren't here on that very first day of April the 25th, 1858, represent some of the many blacks who did come that day on the steamship Commodore or who came shortly afterwards as they did. There were probably at least 600 black people who were part of early day Victoria in 1858 and 1859. There are descendants of many of them still living in Victoria and the immediate area. So the Commodore had several hundred gold crazed miners on board and it had a few dozen members of the first black uh, contingent that were going to arrive here. They were not coming necessarily to be miners. They were going to come because James Douglas had invited them here to take up land and to be farmers and do whatever else they wanted. It was really a complete coincidence that their arrival coincided with the beginning of the gold rush, but they were here on that very first ship. And I showed a picture earlier and we visited the grave of some of the Cridge children. I showed a picture of the Reverend Cridge. The day after the ship arrived, he heard from one of his acquaintances, uh, Mrs. Blinkhorn, that some of the black people had rented a carpenter shop near where she lived at the corner of what is now Broad Street and Yates Street. And she said that they were having a prayer meeting. Well, the Reverend Cridge was curious. This, after all, was his line of work, and so he went to interview some of them, uh, to welcome them here, to find out why they had come, and uh, most importantly, from his point of view, to ask whether they were going to start their own church. He was probably aware that 
the American Methodist Episcopal Church and other black churches were in existence in the United States. And they told him no, um, they weren't going to do that. They would join established churches here if they could. And so he invited them to join the Anglican Church. And many of them became long lifetime members of, of his congregation. And when he broke with the Anglican Church in the 1870s, some of them followed him to the Reformed Episcopal Church that he founded. So when Mrs. Blinkhorn told the Reverend Cridge that she had heard the prayer meeting and the, the singing uh, following their arrival the day before, I would imagine that the, the tune, Blow Ye the Trumpets Blow, was one of the songs that they, they had sung because it was definitely one of the ones that they had been singing in San Francisco. Let's go back into the, the Zoom now. And we will move on to, this is the grave of Nana oh, Estes. We've already been there. She wasn't. We'll go to this one. So I mentioned his name, Captain Jeremiah Nagel. Jeremiah Nagel uh, was Irish. Um, he was here on the West Coast and his ship, the Commodore, plied between San Francisco and Puget Sound ports, stopping in Victoria and probably stopping in Portland as well along the way. Have a closer look. It's a little uncanny, isn't it? Um, if any of you are family historians and are members of my heritage, uh, perhaps you've already seen this little gimmick that is offered to members, um, but you can animate old photographs. And I experimented with a few of my own family. And then I thought, hmm, this is a pretty good picture of Captain Nagel. I wonder if we could do it with that one. And sure enough, let me run it again, just to show you again, if you missed it. It is uncanny and it's so lifelike and in some ways brings out some of the features in these pictures that you probably wouldn't otherwise notice. Anyway, Nagel uh, was a friend of Captain Thomas Pritchard. Thomas Pritchard, uh, we'll find out a bit more about in a moment when I play the next clip, uh, but he was also a steamboat captain resident in Portland. And so let's go to the clip and I'll explain more. This magnificent monument was designed by two architects, Thomas Trounce and John Teague. One was responsible for the monument and one for the now missing cast iron grave fence around it. This is obviously the grave for a wealthy person. Captain Thomas Pritchard was a very wealthy man. He had come to Victoria in 1858 from Portland, Oregon, where he'd lived for a number of years. Originally, he was from Wales, as was his wife, Margaret. They had moved to the States. They had moved across the United States. He was involved in the Black Hawk Wars and the Midwest, ended up in Portland, where he was a steamboat captain. And that's where he made most of his money. The steamship Commodore had plied the coast under the captainship of Jeremiah Nagel from San Francisco up to Portland, up to Puget Sound, up to Victoria, and back again. And it's almost certain that Captain Nagel and Captain Pritchard would have known each other. And one of the intriguing things is, although we know that Pritchard came in 1858, the very first year of the gold rush, we don't know whether he was here on that Sunday, April the 25th, but he was certainly here for the gold rush that year. But he went back to Portland, but moved to Victoria permanently in 1862, bringing his, his wife with him. And they bought property at the end of Mears Street. It was a very large estate. They had no children, but they did have other family members here. And when Margaret Pritchard died in 1871, her husband arranged for this magnificent monument standing on top of a huge vault underneath. In 1871, it was evident that this cemetery was not going to last forever. 
the cemetery trustees for the city of Victoria were already looking for a new site. They hadn't yet chosen the site for Ross Bay Cemetery, but by the following year, they did. Pritchard lived on until 1883, and when he died, he had really hoped that this monument would have been moved at the expense of the city to Ross Bay Cemetery where he could be buried. But it obviously wasn't going to happen. And so he was buried here in the vault next to his wife. Captain Pritchard, when he came to Victoria in 1862, it said never left the city. He vowed that he would never leave the city again and he never did. But we know that there were many other captains who did. Steamboats between here and New Westminster and other points along the Fraser River were very important in the Gold Rush era. In 1858, the very first year of the Gold Rush, most of those steamboats were not in service yet. They came a little bit later. But Captain Thomas Pritchard, a career steamboat captain, would have known them all. His monument and that of Margaret Pritchard is now the most magnificent one here at the old burying ground. And the old cemetery society collected a large sum of money back in the early 1990s to restore this. It was in bad shape. The sandstone was crumbling and even the white marble insets were beginning to be damaged by the corroding iron, the iron that had pinned the marble into the monument. And so this was very carefully scaled back and it was sprayed with uh, something that was going to consolidate the sandstone to not stop, but to slow down the further deterioration. And so far, so good, it has slowed it down a great deal. Now we're almost finished, but I just like to uh, to mention as we work our way around and, and for those of you that know Pioneer Square, you probably realize we've, we've actually gone in a counterclockwise route around the place uh, and we're going to finish up uh, the, the loop by going back to a place not too far from where we started. But um, the monuments that we're going to be looking at next, I don't have video clips of, but I'm just going to talk about them. Uh, the person that I will be showing next is Joseph Despard Pemberton. And Joe Pemberton had been the best man at the 1852 wedding of Cecilia and John Helmkin. He was the one who had drawn the maps that I showed earlier. He was, in fact, the Surveyor General for the colony of Vancouver Island under the Hudson's Bay Company. When the gold rush happened in 1858, uh, prior to the formal establishment of the colony to be called British Columbia, uh, but all through the summer of 1858, things were in a pretty frantic state. And the gold was found on the sandbars up around Hope and Yale, and eventually later up, up the, uh, other parts of the river. But Pemberton went over there at the behest of James Douglas, and he laid out the town sites around the Hudson's Bay Company trading posts at Hope and Yale, and then also at a place called Port Douglas at the north end of Harrison Lake. These were all going to be important places on the route to the gold fields. And on the way to the uh, area around Hope and Yale, Pemberton would have uh, stopped at Port Langley. Now I'm just gonna show this picture to show you a little bit more of his work here is a map that he drew and colored in, or at least somebody else colored it in for him probably. It shows some of the original survey of Victoria and James Bay down at the bottom end, the city lots and some of the larger portions of land, the five acre lots that were available. And if you look very carefully where I've just indicated the yellow circle, you'll see the church reserve and the large a black object is in fact the Victoria District Church, the Anglican Church, but look to the part that sticks up from the green colored church reserve. 
that is the cemetery. And it wasn't really intended to be an Anglican cemetery. It wasn't the churchyard for that church. It just happened to be on the church reserve. It was really intended to be for all people who came here. So this was one of the, the maps that Pemberton had drawn, but he certainly drew many, many others. As I mentioned, he would stop at Fort Langley on his way up to Hope and Yale to survey those town sites, and he would have known James Murray Yale. James Murray Yale was the uh, chief trader in charge of Fort Langley and had been for a number of years for the Hudson's Bay Company and would have come down to Victoria many times, and undoubtedly Pemberton would have known him. But he could not have passed by Fort Langley without stopping in and probably staying for a day or two on his way up the river. Uh, James Murray Yale uh, is the one who uh, was uh, the one that the town site of Yale was named after. And James Murray Yale did eventually move to Victoria in the early 1860s, but in 1858, he was definitely still uh, firmly ensconced at, at Fort Langley. But it was from that vantage point that he would have been well aware of the gold rush because the gold was not in Victoria. We later had a gold rush in nearby Leechtown, but that was rather minor. No, oh, the main gold was on the Fraser River and its tributaries. And to get there, the miners arrived from California here in Victoria, and then by raft and canoe and later by steamboat, they headed across to the Fraser River and they had to pass by Fort Langley. Many of them would have stopped in, perhaps to camp out on the shore, perhaps to, to buy supplies, maybe to get directions, perhaps to ask for an indigenous person to help guide them along the way, because it wasn't easy. So Yale would have been very well aware of the early gold rush. And there's a wonderful illustration from the um, Harper's Magazine from 1858, so very soon after the gold rush happened, showing uh, the river. This is a rather romantic view of the, the river and the fort. You can see some tents uh, and campfires uh, just along the shoreline, probably from some of the miners who were on their way through. They didn't want to stay at Fort Langley. They were on their way to where the gold was, a couple of days hard slogging farther up the river. So we do have lots of stories of the gold rush. Uh, James Murray Yale, as I mentioned, uh, saw the gold rush from his perspective at Fort Langley, but eventually moved to Victoria and bought a huge farm called Stromness Farm along the shores of the Gorge Waterway. Um, he was buried at the old burying ground, Pioneer Square. And there was a bench tomb over his grave for many years. Unfortunately, it collapsed about 25 years ago and the pieces of it were put into storage. But what we do have is this diminutive marker made of concrete that was placed there by the BC Historical Federation back in the 1930s. So that brings me to an end of the, the formal presentation. I'll stay around for a few minutes for questions if there are any, but just to show this uh, final picture. Um, it was done by uh, Josephine Kreese, uh, sorry, by um, uh, Sophie Pemberton, um, who is another very well-known artist in Victoria, and she painted this one sometime in the late 1800s after Pioneer Square had officially closed, after the original Victoria District Church that we've talked about so much had burned and had been replaced. What you see here is the replacement church and the tangled mess that uh, the old burying ground turned into after it was abandoned when Ross Bay Cemetery opened up in 1873. But a, a very evocative view of the old burying ground that we've been talking about today. So I'll come back into the picture and um, ask you if you have any any questions, perhaps, um, Liz, you could uh, help me out if, if there are any. I don't have any questions, but I just want to say that was wonderful, John. Um, although I have to say that that movement of the face with uh, Nagel was totally creepy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but interesting, it's just like you say, it really gives you a different perspective on looking at the image. That's so, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Uh, uh, that was uh, quite a, it must have been a bit of a challenge putting all those pieces together. Well, I must admit it was. And um, I think, uh, hang on. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, I'm actually just trying to get out of the, the slides here again, but hang on. We can only see you, so it doesn't. You can only see me, okay? Because I, I can't now. See, I can see nothing right now, so um, I will just be able to uh, to uh, to talk. So if, if somebody does have a question, I won't be able to say this to see the chat. So um, one of the I wanted to try this out partly because I thought it was going to rain today, and I thought it would be very clever and and have Chris um, videotape me doing a number of the clips. Um, and as you can see, I was just wearing my shirt sleeves. It was a beautiful sunny day, um, and that probably is something to keep in mind. We can do that and save these clips, but the technology was a little bit daunting. And Liz and Paul, who I want to thank again for having borne with me while we were doing some practices, um, I, I discovered that uh, at least, I don't know whether it's my PowerPoint or just my computer, but I could not save all of the clips. I put the whole thing, I put the, the slides together and then I inserted the clips having edited, edited them um, but uh, it crashed. And I discovered that I, it, I could only um, hold about seven clips, but when I put in the eighth, the whole thing just froze and wouldn't work. So it's something to keep in mind for the future. It, uh, uh, we, we, can, we can do this, but um, we have to be careful how many we actually insert. Of course, we, we could videotape the whole thing and then play that, but to actually insert the clips uh, in a PowerPoint presentation, I discovered was a little bit challenging for the technology. Well, they are very large files; those uh, those video sound files. So they that's huge. probably what the limitation is. Yeah, on I think they were huge. So, um, if uh, if there are any other questions, um, please speak up. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll we'll look forward to um, having as many of you as possible on, on future uh, Zooms uh, next week at Chinese Cemetery with Charlene Thornton Joe, and then uh, back to Ross Bay Cemetery for uh, the next ones in the foreseeable future. And we will be staying on Zoom uh, right until the time we're given the, the go ahead and doesn't look as though that's gonna be any time soon uh, to meet in person. So uh, thank you all for for joining today and, and thanks again to, to my son Chris for doing the videotaping and to, to Liz and Paul for, for having helped um, put it together and for hosting it today. Great, well, thank you, John. It's been really, really enjoyable. Yeah, that was excellent. Really, really enjoyed it. Okay, well, if there are no more Chris. Thanks, John. Okay. Welcome. See you all next week. <laughs> Bye-bye.